Other Russian sources have said that he deliberately used Bakhmut as sort of a red flag for the Ukrainian bull and kept those roads open and the opportunity for Ukrainians to reinforce it. Well, they're, they're still trying to push this narrative that this was an unprovoked attack versus uh, a decade of building up and provoking Putin to the point where he felt like my only option is to create this buffer zone. Uh, and unfortunately, Ukraine uh, has, you know, has to become that that buffer zone. Um, let, let's move on to uh, Bakhmut for a minute. Um Russia says Bakhmut has fallen. Uh, Zelensky says, no, it hasn't. We still have soldiers in the area fighting. And until we run out of bodies, uh, this area is not taking, uh, taken. Um, how does the, the, the battle for Bakhmut <clears throat> show, uh, how military strategies and goals can change over time? And in your opinion, uh, has Bakhmut fallen into the hands of Russia? Well, Bakhmut, 90% of it has been in Russian hands now for months. It's only this small sliver of land on the very edge that remained in uh, Ukrainian hands. And they occupied some concrete reinforced buildings, very large sort of high-rise like buildings. And the Russians were very reluctant to destroy them because they had information that there were Russian civilians in the basements. We have to understand that you're operating in a part of Ukraine where the population is really Russian. Now, they may have been Ukrainian citizens, but of course, Ukrainians treated them badly, didn't allow them to speak their language, have their schools, worship as they saw fit. They did not have equal rights before the law. They were an oppressed minority. And and every time someone that was Russian would complain, look, I'm a Ukrainian citizen. I'm happy to do whatever. Just give me my equal rights. They said, well, there's, there's a country. It's called Russia. You can leave here and go there. So... The Russians did not want to kill large numbers of Russian civilians in eastern Ukraine. That slows everything down. It has slowed everything down from the beginning. People don't get it. That's That's been a major uh, constraint on the conduct of Russian military operations. Secondly, they then saw virtue and necessity to some extent. Remember, Surovikin comes in. He's from the aerospace forces. He takes over the theater. Uh, in the fall, completely changes the chain of command, streamlines it, creates unity of command. And he decides that as long as the Russians are building up their forces for future operations against Ukrainians, that he's going to run a, 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 a now what I would call a relatively elastic defense, uh, an economy of force operation. In other words, to use minimal force to maintain control of the areas that the Russians have while at the same time uh, enticing the Ukrainians in to fight, inviting them in, essentially, to attack. Bakhmut suddenly became very attractive to him. <clears throat> we now know from what Mr. Prigozhin has said and other Russian sources have said that he deliberately used Bakhmut as sort of a red flag for the Ukrainian bull and kept those roads open and the opportunity for Ukrainians to reinforce it. Now, the, the, we see a lot of evidence that upwards of 50,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed in and around Bakhmut. That's a huge number of people. We don't, you know, we know at least that many were wounded. And the bad news with a lot of the Ukrainian wounded is that they never returned to duty. So just, you know, the Russians have been pretty good at getting somewhere around 70 to 80 percent <clears throat> their soldiers back to the front lines after a couple of months of recuperation. Ukrainians have been unable to do that for a whole range of reasons. So the losses were really staggering. And I think it is not an exaggeration to suggest that Bakhmut really is the graveyard of the Ukrainian army. And Zelensky's obsession with Bakhmut is on par with Hitler's obsession with Stalingrad. And what people don't understand is that the Germans didn't have to have or occupy or control Stalingrad. Long before the 6th Army even arrived on the Volga River, the only thing of value in Stalingrad was an aircraft factory, a place where the Russians were literally building fighters. That was destroyed by the German Air Force. There was really no reason to, you know, over overreach with your forces and go that far east. 
But then Hitler did it. He, and he was sort of attracted to this. Well, it's called Stalingrad. <clears throat> so this is a kind of strategic grudge match with uh, Stalin. And Stalin, you know, said, we're not leaving Stalingrad and fed more and more and more troops in there. Of course, the difference was that he could afford a million casualties. The Germans could not. So the bottom line is Zelensky has treated Bakhmut in the same way. It becomes a symbol of Ukrainian resistance. And I think we are probably equally guilty of encouraging him to do that. And instead of being a symbol of resistance, it was just a sponge for blood. And that's why, you know, I think in retrospect, two, three, four years from now, people will look back on this war and they will say, well, Bakhmut was a huge turning point because the Ukrainians couldn't replace their losses. They couldn't replace all the equipment losses. And the Russians took very few casualties and lost almost no equipment. The outcome was a catastrophe for Ukraine. And I think that's pretty clear. But, of course, the mainstream media has its script. They're going to continue to read from it. They're not going to tell you the truth. And until you have, uh, I'm, I really say this all the time, and it's depressing to me, but I guess until you have Russian forces on the west side of the Dnieper and they overrun Odessa and they they move north and take Kharkov, people will finally, finally recognize, my, my goodness, you know, what happened to the great victory? What happened to the inevitable Ukrainian success story? Then maybe people will wise up. Yeah. I don't Joining us now to weigh in on the war and these latest revelations concerning equipment, financing, the jets, you name it. And for some truth, he's a former advisor to the SecDef under Trump, our pal, Colonel Doug McGregor. Colonel, welcome back to the program. Uh, Where do I begin? Jets, money. He said, she said, cities are overrun. No, they're not. Um, I guess let's go with the latest, a major city. Zelensky says, nope, we still have it. Russia says, (coughs) nope, we've got it. Fill us in. No, I think that's a good place to start because I think historically Bakhmut in Ukraine will be remembered as the graveyard of the Ukrainian army. Bakhmut was a place that the Russians could have taken a long time ago. They made a deliberate decision not to do it. And they left roads available and open to the north and to the uh, west so that the Ukrainians could pour forces into the place. Mm. We now think that at least 50,000 Ukrainian troops were killed there probably more, and obviously many, many more uh, wounded. It's, it's reached the point now where, frankly, the Ukrainian army is decimated, and they're struggling right now to force more people into uniform and to bring about 30,000 uh, Ukrainian soldiers from being trained in the United States, Germany, Czech Republic, Canada, U- United Kingdom, back uh, to Ukraine in the hopes that they could put something together uh, that will be capable of counterattacking. So I think, I think uh, Bakhmut is the big turning point. And, and if you watched this weekend in Politico, there was a wonderful article about the Biden administration's uh, consideration of pressing for a quote unquote frozen conflict. In other words, people have finally decided there's no chance that Ukraine can win. So maybe we can uh, do to Ukraine what we did to Korea. We can split it. We can have a DMZ. And so we can maintain hostility to Russia. But this allows uh, everyone to stop fighting. The problem, of course, is the Russians have no intention of tolerating that on their doorstep because it doesn't change anything for them. But I think it's a, it's real evidence of just how badly Ukraine is losing right now and has been for some time. The other, the other points that you made, you know, when you talk about the F-16s, it's desperation. Yeah, it's desperation. That's that's what we're dealing with. What do we send? What have we got left? Remember, we don't have much left. We produce, what, three or 400 Patriot missiles every year, maximum. Uh, we've run through our war stocks. Uh, we are really in a very difficult position. Somebody asked me the other day, well, if we go to war, uh, can we win a war? I said, well, I suppose if it lasts a week. He said, why? Because in a week, we run out of everything. Ammunition, missiles, rockets, you name it. <clears throat> That's how badly depleted our war stocks are. And so now, well, send them F-16s. But the danger here is something Americans don't want to miss. Mm-hmm. Ukrainians aren't going to be able to fly those things in combat. Right. If those aircraft fly, they're going to be flown in all probability by so-called American volunteers. That's wow. very dangerous. 
Because if any of them are shot down, and I think that's a certainty if they fly into these integrated air defenses, uh, they'll be treated not as a legitimate soldier, but as mercenaries. And mercenaries have no protection under the Geneva Convention. Okay, that's scary stuff. Um, I guess I'll just end with money, because Joe just approved another <laughs> $375 million, and then we've got the underestimate, because some <clears throat> official, one person, nobody caught this at the Pentagon? I mean... Doug, you were there. I, I know we have dumb people working in our federal government, but how the hell do you go a value equipment worth three bill and you under because you didn't know it was used versus new? I mean, that doesn't take a Harvard PhD or anything, does it? Uh, Dan, I would tell you they're <laughs> dumb like foxes. Uh, these people aren't stupid. They're just deceitful and dishonest. Uh-huh. And we have a problem. We have a problem in the Department of Defense, and have had it for at least two or three decades. We can't really audit the defense budget. Nobody really knows how much money is spent and where it all goes. So that's problem number one. Right now, we own Ukraine. We're paying for its government, its armed forces, medical care, pensions. There may only be fewer than twenty Ukrainians, twenty million Ukrainians left in Ukraine, but uh, nevertheless, we own it. Uh,